Hey everybody, this is Michael Dwayne Shaker today, and this is the first episode of a new show we're trying to start called La Esquina. La Esquina in Spanish means the corner, and so the idea behind it is that we're going to talk about all kinds of different language topics in this. So today I've got some different news I've been following throughout the week, and I want to share that with you today. And uh, so here we go. So the first one, the first piece of news I have is something about a California bill that was passed recently that makes it makes uh, to where independent contractors now have to be hired by a company basically and so it affects linguists because in that state because interpreters and translators have to be basically hired by companies now so that they can collect stuff like unemployment benefits and health benefits and stuff like that and it's a problem because there's a lot of a lot of work, a lot of translator and interpreter work is only short term, so it doesn't really, it doesn't really help because there's a lot, a lot of these translation firms they can't really afford to keep these people on full time because the work is very, is very short term. And there's also a lot of linguists that don't want to work full time for these places. They, they just want to work for themselves. So they're trying to work on something with California right now to try to get that, you know, to make more leeway for their type of career because. You know, interpreters and translators are usually um, are usually contract workers. So the 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 next piece of news that I have is that scientists have been tracking a woman for the last 30 years, from 1986 until uh, until 2016, um, and she could kept a diary of you know just a radio diary. I don't know what the frequency of it was, but she kept this diary for 30 years and. For the first 24 years that they tracked it, when she started, the 24 years after she started writing her journal, she, um, they noticed that she was using, one of the biggest things she, they were noticing was that she wasn't using pronoun at the beginning. So she would say, she would say, you know, started cooking muffins, cooked, uh, baked, baked some muffins, made some cookies. But after she got all time reserved at the 24 year mark, then she started using, she started using more formalities. So she started saying, you know, I made cookies today. And she did her chores. Like she actually started using this thing and started using more formal language. That's the only piece of, that's the only like definite piece of, of grammar that I have um, that I know of from the article. They also said that people that experience dementia type diseases tend to, when um, tend to forget the things that they learn later on in life first. So if you learn, for example, if you learn like English and Spanish and French when you were like, I don't know, 10, 14, and 18 years old but you learn how to speak Portuguese when you're like 30 and you learn how to speak Russian when you were 40, then you're probably going, you're, you're probably going to forget your Russian and your Portuguese first before you forget the French and the Spanish and the English. So I thought that was interesting how they were able to track this woman's thing and how they were, and how that people are using, or tend to use more formal language whenever they get dementia-based um, dementia disorders. The next piece I have is, this isn't really recent news because the person that spoke this language died in like 1991, but there was, she said that her, she said that her, her wealth was her, was her storytelling. She said that she didn't have any money to leave for her grandchildren, so she would record all these stories. So for the vast majority of her life, she recorded, she recorded stories in Tagish and in Tlingi. Tagish is now an extinct language, it went extinct in 2008 after the last speaker died. She actually gave classes, but that's just a different speaker. This person's name was Angela Sidney. She was raised from a, she had a Twingy father and a Togish mother, and she was one of the last speakers, but she remembered growing up and having Togish and Twingy ancestors like going out to hunt deer or they would go fishing in the summertime. And she would, she would hear all the language all the time and, and they would share stories with her and stuff like that. When she got older and they kind of died off, she didn't have anyone to speak it with, but then she married a white Canadian man, the province of the Northwest Territories in Canada. She believed that she should be able to pass this on to her children, whereas it was kind of funny because at the time, most tribes believed forgetting the language and that only using English would get them would further their careers and their lives in America or in Canada. This lady was like, she spoke Tlingit and she spoke Togish to her children, and she spoke both, she spoke Togish, Tlingit, and English all fluently, and she got her education sporadically at an Anglican school. She said, I don't want this to die with, with my people, so she focused on Togish because the Togish culture was a little bit more endangered, and the Tlingit community was still pretty vibrant at that time because there's thousands and thousands of them, and it's also spoken in Alaska. She passed this on to her children, and after her children grew up, because she had six children, but four of them, um, four of them died prematurely. And the other two grew grew up to become adults. She 
kept, she continued to pass it on to her grandchildren, and she also continued to pass to pass it on the story. So she worked with the linguists in the 60s and 70s to record as much of this as she could. She died in 1991, but she recorded so much stuff. So it's just really cool that somebody was able to record all this stuff that they did. One of her companions, who was younger than she was, because she was actually born when this other speaker was already an adult, she continued to give language classes in Tagish. Not, not, she focused more on Tagish than Tlingi, because Tlingi was already, you know, like I said earlier, it was already, it was a more vibrant community. I thought that was interesting. Another piece of news I found, which isn't really language related, but it can help shed more light on language, is that 61,000 sites were discovered. Um, they were all Mayan sites. They use this special technology that allows them to see the terrain of wherever they're at. And they were able to see, you know, thousands and thousands of different Mayan sites. And they found these roads that connected them to, you know, little cities which connected them to other cities and so on and so forth and in a sort of like little Mayan empire type country thing. And so they, and so just imagine if there's 61,000 different sites and we've already uncovered 90% of what the Mayan glyphs mean, just imagine how many more glyphs there, there could be, right? So with, with Mayan, you have like classical Mayan, which was like, you know, before Christ or before, you know, zero BC or BCE. And then you have a lot of stuff that was made after, and you know, in the ACE, after the Common Era. So you have a whole lot of Mayan glyphs that were discovered and they deciphered them. So there's different stages of, of the Mayan language. But just imagine if you have 61,000 more sites, what that means for the Mayan language. They could discover thousands of, you know, words that haven't been discovered. They could discover, you know, they get a larger corpus. They could find more stuff. They could learn more about the life, more, even more about the life of the Mayans and their civilization, you know, throughout time. So I thought that was exciting. So I'm hoping that I'm hoping to hear more about the about more glyphs being discovered and maybe getting another ten percent deciphered. <laughs> so the next piece I have is that um, there um, Indi Indonesia's indigenous languages can actually be the key to surviving disaster. So in Indonesia, um, the the country's kind of going through a little bit of a transition right now with languages because. Indonesian is being promoted as more of like this national language in the same way that Malagash is in Madagascar or, you know, in other places where they're trying to, you know, or Hindi in India, they're trying to promote one language or Chinese Mandarin in China, for example. You know, they're trying to promote one language. And so in, in Indonesia, um, there's still many communities that have their original languages, such as in, you know, in these more homogenous communities like I can't remember exactly what the name of this specific language was, but it's a, it's a very homogenous community, but they also have mountains. So when the tsunami comes, they have ancient, they have ancient fables that tell of, you know, you, need to, you know, if you see this thing in the water, you need to go up before, because that means that a tsunami is coming and you notice these types of clouds in the sky that you need to go. And then they say, smong, smong, which means tsunami in this language. And then everybody knows that to go. And this has actually been proven to be better than the early warning modern systems that they have now. So this has been, because it's better than this system, a lot of people are starting to think like, hmm, maybe we should pass on these indigenous stories and, and fables on to, you know, to people so that, you know, so that when we see these types of disasters coming, they can predict it based on ancient wisdom and ancient knowledge and save, and save even more people. Only seven people died in the last tsunami from this specific tribe of people, whereas in other places in Indonesia, hundreds and hundreds of people died. So this place had a much lower rate because people were able to were better prepared because they used wis ancient wisdom. So there is also a couple other places where this is happening in more heterogeneous communities. However, um, however, this people are thinking more about pushing this out on a, on a bigger and bigger scale. So the next piece I have is uh, Jamaica. So um, Jamaica's, Jamaica, Jamaican Patois is the national language of Jamaica. So English is an official language there and that's what, you know, what the government tends to speak and what everybody tends to speak. But Jamaican Patois is the real language of Jamaica. That's the language of the streets. However, its prestige goes way beyond Jamaica. Jamaican Patois is a language that is you know is known in many African countries like you're seeing people in Uganda in Ghana in Nigeria and there's tons of people all over the African diaspora you know it's not just music anymore you know it's you have the Jamaican diaspora in the United States and in Canada who 
are trying to assess court services in Jamaican Patois, and they have a right to it in interpreter as per the article. And so you, you not only do you have a larger need of Jamaican interpreters in courts and stuff, but there's also people that are learning Jamaican Patois as a second language, not just for music, but because they're interested in Jamaican language and culture. And so the organ, there's an organization, I believe it's called like the Jamaican Language Alliance or um, some kind of organization like that, um, that promotes the Jamaican Patois language. And they're working to make a, a course for second language learners of Jamaican Patois and to push out this language as much as they can because the interest is growing. It's not diminishing, it's growing. And this is one of the few cases in the world where, you know, where the language is not dying, but it's growing. So like Papiamento in Aruba or in the, in the Dutch Caribbean, so to speak. So that's pretty cool. So the next one I have is there was a man in there was a man in India. He was he is the president of some deaf deaf association of students or deaf um, deaf people, and he got a master's degree in linguistics. He's completely deaf in his right ear, and he only has thirty percent hearing capacity in his left ear. However, he got his degree, and he he said he noted that the hardest part for him to understand in his linguistics degree courses were the phonetics or the phonetics portion because he couldn't hear and process sounds so he was just like how you know how am i supposed to understand the phonetics when i can't hear the sounds but he still got through the degree and his wife interpreted his wife interprets and interpreted a lot of stuff for him he didn't he didn't even need interpreter for a lot of these in linguistics courses which was pretty interesting but he believes that more could be done to promote linguistics um for the for the deaf and that there isn't enough deaf language support in um in india the indian sign language is what most deaf indians use to communicate with each other however the language is not really supported by the government there's not a lot of services in the language and you know they, he believes that a lot of discrimination is being caused because the government doesn't invest enough in deaf communities because there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in india that are deaf and that use this language but he believes that the power of linguistics can bring about change in deaf communities and people's understanding of deaf communities and their inclusion into society because they are being excluded from society because the government doesn't help like for example in his specific state india there are no deaf language interpreters at all and grant and mind you most indian states have more than 100 million citizens living inhabitants living in each state so just imagine you have a state where you have a hundred thousand a hundred million speakers of some spoken language but there are no deaf interpreters so they have to come from other indian states and he said and a lot of states you have to be certified in that specific indian state in order to practice as a deaf interpreter so he's so this is just one of the examples he uses as to why people need to pay more attention to deaf communities and promote this because they speak a language too you know and their nuances aren't really understood because people don't they're not they're not really you know emphasized and there's not a lot of deaf language courses out there i hope to get you guys enjoyed this video i would appreciate any interactions or comments that you might have like this video subscribe if you want more content and i look forward to seeing you guys in the next video thank you